Whispering. Whispering Street. And here is Betty Davis. Hello. It was a week, seven short days before her wedding. And Dana Russell was going over linen lists with her mother. 48 of this, 48 of that, 48 of the other thing, and all monographs. She held up a lace doily. She studied it with something approaching to tape. And don't you like it, Dana? Your most expensive luncheon set. I know, Mother. I know. I like it as much as I like anything, I suppose. Well, what do you mean by that? Nothing. Everything. <sighs> Why am I getting married, Mother? It's the thing to do. It isn't the thing for me to do. Just one year ago, I was in love with another man. Remember? I'd rather not. So would I. But it's an impossibility. I can't seem to forget that I was guilty. Just a year ago. Oh, and he was all wrong for you. He was a meringue. Quite of egg beaten to a stiff froth. I don't have to tell you, Dana, that I was jilted two years ago. That I married your stepfather, whom I'd known for 20 years on the rebound. Well, I've been divinely happy ever since. Doesn't that mean anything? To you, yes, but not to me. I was terribly disillusioned when you became engaged to a... A mere boy after being a widow for so many years. And then your second marriage sort of ironed me out. And it gave me the courage to get engaged to Lanny. And then he jilted me just one week before the wedding. And I was a wreck all last summer. I couldn't stand it, Mother. Not twice in the same place. But when winter came, you had a marvelous time. Mark Redfield happened along just after Thanksgiving and gave you a rush, and in April he proposed. He not only proposed, he gave me a ring that filled up my threadbare ego. I'm very fond of Mark. He's worth a million lannies. He has more money than your stepfather. That's good? Why, it's better than good, dear. Nobody can say that Mark's marrying you for your money. You're right. Nobody can say that. Why is he marrying me, Mother? Because you're a beautiful girl, darling. Because he loves you devotedly and dearly. I don't think he loves me one little bit. Now, that's absurd. Why should he ask you to marry him? I might as well come clean, Mother. Mark put it on the line the night he proposed. I remember what he said, word for word. He said, we like each other, Dana. We have similar tastes. He said, I know all about your romance with Lanny. But now that's past. I need a hostess and a companion. And eventually, I'd like to have a couple of well-bred, attractive kids. Then I'll be a grandmother. Oh, dear. He'll make you a marvelous husband, Dana. Oh, sure. I'm a lucky girl. I've never dared ask before, but... Are you still in love with Lanny? No. No, that's all over and done with. I'll never love anyone again, Mother. Your burnt child dreads the fire. Fox said the night we became engaged that we'd never quarrel. You see, I told him how violent my feelings had been for Lanny. How violent Lanny's feelings for me had apparently been. Had apparently been. Mother, is that a split infinitive? Yeah, no. Well, Mark said that our feelings for each other weren't violent enough to provoke quarrels or, or any major sort of unpleasantness. I think that's rather wonderful. Yes, of course it is. You and Mark will lead an ideal existence. Mm. A glamorous life racing from here to there, getting parties at which I'll be a good hostess. Oh, you've had lessons from an expert. In other words, from me. That I have. Giving birth to occasional and well-mannered children. Handsome children, too, if they take after our family. And when Mark and I are in our 70s and celebrate our golden wedding... Oh, let's skip the truth over a while, Mother, huh? 
All right. I'm going out. More shopping? No. I'm going for a drive. Alone? Yes. I couldn't go along if you say the word. I'd rather you didn't, Mother. I'm anxious to invite what's... what's left of my soul. In just a moment, Betty Davis will be back again. But first... Family protection to survivors of a serviceman covered by Social Security include monthly Social Security checks to a widow with minor children. Starting with the month of the death, a check will go to the widow, and a separate check is made out to the children. The widow's payments will continue while the children are under 18 years of age. The payments stop, however, if the widow remarries or goes to work. Remember, these Social Security benefits are paid in addition to other survivor checks payable by the Veterans Administration. Have you investigated your Social Security benefits? And now, back to our story with Betty Davis. Jane had dropped the kiss on her mother's serene forehead and drifted out of the room and out of the house. But once in the open air, her pace quickened. She hurried into the garage and climbed into her convertible and backed out of the driveway. As she was turning it into the main road. Hi there. Where are you going? Oh, oh, Mark. I, I didn't expect you until later. I'm going for a drive. I'll open up the door, honey, and I'll climb in. Oh, Mark, I'd rather not. Run into the house and wait for me. Mother's there. She'll give you something cool to drink. Well, if you think I'll let you wander off alone just one week before your wedding, you've got another thing coming. Don't you trust me? Well, yes and no. Let's settle on saying that something might happen to you and I'm not taking any chances. You might even run away from me at the almost 11th hour. It's been done. One more crack like that and I'll wash your mouth with yellow soap. Open the door and let me in. Oh, well. I wanted to be alone, Mark. Truly, I did. Why don't you let me stop the car? Why don't you climb out and go back to the house? Every so often, I'm uncooperative. And this is one of the times. Where are we off to, Dana? What difference does it make? In heaven's name, what difference does it make? None, really, although I... Well, might I suggest the, the nice stretch of road that runs alongside the lake? If I recall the incident, a, a certain young man asked a certain young woman to marry him while they were driving along that road. Why did you ask me to marry you, Mark? Aside from meeting a hostess and wanting to... Aside from those two important details, I like the shape of your ears and the way your eyelashes tangle. I'm glad my ears and eyelashes please. I'll turn here. The lake's in the opposite direction. Well, I've decided I'm not going to drive down the lake road. I'm going to town. I want to plow through heavy traffic. When I'm driving in traffic, I don't have time to think. Is it so painful to think? Yes. Mark, when you asked me to marry you, I, I, I tried not to cheat. I told you all about Lanny. So you did. I told you that Lanny fairly begged for his release. If I recall the incident, he took it on the lamb. And at the moment, he's married and living in California. Lanny got married the week after he broke our engagement. That's why he broke it. He's crazy about somebody else. I wasn't exciting enough to hold him. Lanny didn't break the engagement. Dana, fate broke it. Coming events cast their shadow. Coming events? Me. Listen, Mark. This afternoon, I was counting the trousseau linens with Mother, and all at once, I realized that I couldn't stand in front of an altar with you and, and, and make all sorts of promises. I shouldn't be talking like this with a wedding only a week away. I should be full of goosebumps. Goosebumps aren't very attractive. 
You know, I got them when I saw my first birthday cake. But after I ate the entire cake, I had a bellyache. When Lanny broke our engagement, I had a heartache. It nearly killed me. I was still only half alive when I met you. My wedding dress was still in the closet, and most of the presents were in the house. But they weren't as super as our presents. And I bet there weren't nearly as so many of them. Your mother tells me that your current wedding dress is something for the birds of paradise. I sent the original number to a thrift shop. It was sold for charity. Mark, don't you ever suffer about anything? Exactly one mile back, I suffered about a speed cop. Look, Dana, we're, we're starting from scratch, and, and and Lanny and last year's wedding dress are, are in the discard. And the thought of being married to you has taken a terrific hold of my imagination. Are you so fond of me that you'd mind if our wedding didn't happen? Why should we wander in the realm of the impossible? Oh, I'm not wandering. Mark, when I started out alone this afternoon, I really wanted to be alone, so... So I could decide whether I were doing the right thing. About marrying me? Well, that's what's on your mind. You're okay. Let me be the judge. Hey. Hey, hey, we're coming into the outskirts of town. There'll soon be traffic lights. Yes. Yeah. Mark, it's only this afternoon that I dared face back. Last summer, you I was... You were wearing a blue bathing suit, and you had polish on your toenails the afternoon I saw you for the first time. Your eyes were full of ashes. The ashes of dreams. I knew I had to move softly. Oh, don't tease me. Last summer, I went after you hammer and tongs. I'll remind you of that when we're 30 or 40 or 50. I'd been jilted publicly, and I wanted to show the bunch. My girlfriends and the men who were Lanny's friends who were going out of their way to be nice, and my mother and father and the upstairs maid and everybody. So, when you swallowed the bait and asked me to I marry you... I didn't swallow any bait. I know my way around. On the road beside the lake. That's where I asked you to marry me. I accepted you. And at the beginning, it was fun to realize that everybody was surprised. It was fun, too, being with someone who didn't try to maul you. The situation required tact. You've been tactful right through. No signs of passion. Mark, it was only today that I realized something. Making a second mistake doesn't justify a first mistake. Let's call off our wedding. You can say you jilted me, just as Lanny jilted me. No. But it won't be fair to have people gossiping about it, to have them saying I let you down. I... I know how it feels, Mark. I wasn't referring to, to who shot what off whose head. My no meant that we'll not call off the wedding. But I've come to my senses, Mark. I, I, I don't want to be married. You need to be married. And as for me... Well, you haven't a small chance of squirming out of it, Dana. You can't hold me against my will. You're a gentleman, Mark. Only to a point. Oh, better stop, Dana. There's a red light. You're being so stubborn. You don't really love me. And you're good-looking and rich. You can marry anybody. There, yeah, you can start again. The light's green. I was saying you don't love me and you can marry anybody. You think we can be happy with a platonic arrangement. I think we'll both be miserable. This is the first time you've ever been honest, Dana. So I'm going to be just as outspoken. I... Oh, for heaven's sake, Dana, there on the road ahead of you. Turn the wheel hard. <laughs> Dog. Stray dog. We barely missed him, Mark. Yeah, but the car coming the other way didn't. Oh. Pull up alongside the road and be quick about it. Stay here, Dana. I'll go to investigate. And don't what? In just a moment, Betty Davis will be back. There are many isms in the world of today. Some good, some bad. But there is one ism there can never be enough of. Humanitarianism. 
Here's a little episode illustrating how a United States Air Force sergeant and his wife combined a bit of humanitarianism with Americanism. And how, even though handicapped by a language barrier, their efforts worked out very well. It all happened on a dingy street in Fukuoka, Japan. A Japanese couple suddenly dashed out into the street, the woman clutching a baby in her arms. The couple signaled frantically, but the traffic flowed by, ignoring their efforts for help. Finally, one car came to a stop. The occupants were Tech Sergeant Oliver A. Morris and his wife, out to enjoy a late afternoon and evening off duty. What moved Sergeant Morris to stop? Later he found that hard to explain, unless perhaps it just seemed the human thing to do, for neither he nor his wife knew any Japanese. Yet those pathetic figures in the street somehow conveyed great distress and urgency. Sergeant Morris sensed there was something to be done and in a hurry. Much later, he learned the baby had been seized with convulsions. The parents had rushed to a small hospital nearby, and its only doctor was out. They knew of another physician a mile and a half away, and were trying to flag down a taxi when Sergeant Morris came along. The airman bundled them into his car and sped off in their search for a doctor, whom they finally succeeded in locating. When the spasms of the baby were finally checked, the woman looked up with brimming eyes and said, as an interpreter translated, my husband and I, we have been afraid of Americans before. Now we are glad to know such fine people. It cost the Morrises much of the carefree evening they had previously planned. But their unselfish actions towards that Japanese family brought a feeling of goodwillism that will never be forgotten. Sergeant Morris and his wife also gave all of us a thought to remember. We are Americans. As we go, so goes America. Now, back to our story with Betty Davis. A mongrel, a little brown and white scrap of dog, it had wandered aimlessly into the thick of traffic. As Dana, despite orders, watched through tears, Mark reached down and picked up the shivering creature and carried it back to the car. Oh, poor little guy. He's trying to get away from me. He doesn't trust a soul. He's still struggling to get away. Every move he makes must be agonizing. That's his last stab at self-preservation. Turn the car, Dana. We passed an animal hospital about a mile back. Maybe there's an internal injury. Ah, he doesn't need me to Reach me the sweater that's in the back and get going. Here's the sweater. Yeah, thanks. Ah, there, now, sir. We got your fixed, so you can't hurt yourself anymore. Dana, he's licking my hand. You've got blood all over you. So what? Keep your eyes peeled for that animal hospital, Dana. Let's hope we get there in time. Mark reached the animal hospital in two minutes flat. A doctor in a white coat took the hurt dog from Mark. Now there were splashes of blood on his coat. And Dana began to sway oddly and, well, just as everything went flat, she felt Mark's arm go around her and heard his voice saying odd, unexpected words. And when things became normal again... Where am I? On a couch in the outer office. Mm. You fainted. You're a sissy. Where's the puppy? He's being x-rayed. Oh, d- don't try to get up, Dana, for a while yet. But if you want to, you, you can hold my hand. Perhaps then you'll feel less shaky. It, it's a good hand. It does make me feel less shaky. Thanks. How long was I out? Long enough. Mm. Oh. Keep your fingers crossed. Here comes the doctor. In a split second, we'll know what's what. Dana leaned back with her eyes closed while Mark went to interview the doctor. She heard a rumble of voices. She couldn't distinguish the words. And then she heard Mark's footsteps coming back, 
And she opened her eyes and sat up, and he took her by the arm and guided her outside. It was only when they started toward the car that she asked the question. Is he dead? Oh, heavens no. There weren't any bones broken. And there were no internal injuries. Oh. His problem was a few cuts and bruises and shock. The vet suggested putting him to sleep because he's a stray, but... Well, I maintain that the only difference between being a stray and not being a stray is... is belonging to someone, right? Mm, so right. That's why I told the doctor to patch him up and then feed him up. I said we'd call for him as soon as we were back from... from the little trip we're starting on a week from now. I gave the doctor a check to cover his board and medical expenses. They were back in the car again, but Mark was behind the wheel. Dana was in no condition to drive. She sat huddled beside him. And he didn't speak until she shivered suddenly. And then... Cold? No, that isn't why I shivered. I was thinking of that dog running blindly in traffic with the whole world crowding in. Oh, most of us run blindly at one time or another. And the world has a way of crowding in on us. Until something hits us. Until the truth hits us. Oh, Mark, why was I so stupid? Why didn't I realize that you were kind and tender? Why didn't I realize that you weren't cold and, and calm and detached and, and platonic? That you were only waiting for me to come to my senses. Say what I'm saying now. Are you saying that you love me as much as I love you? Definitely. Park the car beside the road for a minute, dear. And kiss me. I don't want to wait like a respectable woman who's going to have a dozen well-bred children until we're home. because we're afraid to trust people. Because often, we're afraid to trust ourselves. You haven't met Larry Legend, the man who jilted Dana, but you've heard a lot about him. And unless I'm very wrong, you've gathered the impression that he was something of a heel. how many nice girls fall for heels. It's the eighth wonder of the world, the eighth tragedy of the world. Well, I'll bring you the story of Lanny and the girl he married. Until then, this is Betty Davis saying goodbye from the whispering street. This program was written by Margaret E. Sankster. Featured in the cast were Barbara Eiler, Virginia Gregg, and Lee Millar. Whispering Streets was directed by Gordon T. Hughes and produced by Ted Lloyd. Your announcer is Dan Coverley. Whispering Streets has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.